Thank you, David. Uh, it's an uh, honour and a privilege to be here speaking at the uh, Existentialist Society, that society which does not exist, uh, which is uh, present in its absence, like uh, Pierre in Sarkis Cafe, perhaps. But uh, today I'm going to talk about real ethics and say what I mean by real ethics. To start off, I want to say I mean something very ordinary. By real, I mean as opposed to imaginary. We're going to be talking about real ethics as opposed to imaginary ethics. Now, to illustrate what I mean by that, I'm going to go to Lacan because that's basically where this directive comes from. This is what Lacan says in his uh, seminar seven, his uh, ethics seminar, the ethics of psychoanalysis, which he uh, wrote, he, uh, which he gave uh, orally in uh, 1959. It went through to 1960, and he says, "Well." As odd, it, as odd as it may seem to that superficial opinion, superficial opinion, so it's saying there's something he wants to distance himself from, yeah, which assumes any inquiry into ethics must concern the field of the ideal, if not the unreal, comma, big comma, I, not the comma, right, on the contrary, will proceed instead from the other direction by going more deeply into the notion of the real. So instead of going towards the ideal, Right, to talk about ethics, going towards the ideal, like perhaps certain moralists might do, he's going to say, now that's very superficial. There's something, something wrong with that. I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I'm going to go further into the real. And then as a little sort of hint as to what's coming, it says, one has to look at what occurred in the interval between Aristotle and Freud. What occurred in the interval between Aristotle and Freud? The Christian Dark Ages, perhaps? Right? I'll just throw that out there as a little, little teaser. But perhaps that's what the consequence is of going into an inquiry into ethics in a superficial way, or sticking to the surface, or even inflating like the bellows away from the surface towards the ideal, towards the unreal. Because what kind of ethics are we going to come up with if we are caught up in the imaginary, in the ideal, and in the unreal? What are we trying to moderate? The drives? Nature? Desire? Don't we have to know what it is first? Don't we have to know what's real about it first? Lacan is going to say yes. And in this project, I think he, he's in good company. And you can, you can also see the, the sort of genealogical dimension. Look at the interval between Aristotle and Freud. Um, you see, often he's just reading Freud's text closely, right? He's, he's a Freudian, he's a, he's a famous Freudian, comes in the, uh, the French tradition, post-war Paris, for those of you not uh, familiar with him, a French Freudian, but he's also very philosophical. He's very interested in phenomenology, the big uh, Hegel, uh, Husserl, Heidegger, uh, Kojev's Marxist reading of Hegel, uh, and, you know, some other traditions and... Uh, and um, discourses that were emerging in his time, structuralist linguistics, other stuff. What you don't get a lot of in Lacan is Nietzsche. And so I guess in my position as a, as a philosopher who was very interested in Lacan's project, because I started reading Freud and I thought, you know, Freud's doing something very interesting here. He's extending, I think, what Nietzsche has uncovered in the sexual direction, in the direction of the sexual real, with some more details about mechanisms about the nature of the drives, the sexual drives, you know, from the oral to the anal and the genital phases and the child's psychosexual development, the kinds of taboos that are at the bottom of them, no, no pun intended. Okay, maybe just a little bit intended. And this is all part of the ethics of going further into the real. All right? We're going to learn what the real is first, then we're going to come up with an ethics in response to it that is more appropriate because we know precisely that which we're trying to uh, moderate or respond to appropriately. <coughs> now, one of the most important things about Nietzsche's project is that he calls for a revaluation of all values, right? If you look at his, uh, his final work, the Echo Homo, the, um, the autobiography, he says, 
My project, what I call for, is a re-evaluation of all values. What's wrong with our values? What values is he talking about? He's talking about moral values, right? What's wrong with them? He thinks they've become denaturalized. He thinks they've turned us against nature. We've developed a culture that's against nature. Why did we do this? His answer, as he said in a letter to Overbeck, who I think was his theologian friend from Basel, it's all Plato's fault. Plato is the greatest misfortune of Europe. I love how expressive Nietzsche is. So when I, start, when I start off this book by looking at Nietzsche's critique of Platonism, what I'm doing is setting the base from which Freud continues and then Lacan after him. Okay, what's wrong with Plato's, um, Plato's project? He comes up with an idea of the good, which he thinks is not only turns us against nature, but is itself imaginary. It's an imaginary which he calls the most real. So he's already confused us, Nietzsche says. He's reversed us, not just in terms of our attitude towards nature and the drives and desire and instincts and our animality, but also epistemically. We, we can't tell the difference between fact and fiction anymore. The less real, the more value. This is Platonism. Well, that's Nietzsche saying what Platonism is in the condensed formula. We fail to recognise how astonishing this is sometimes, Nietzsche says, this reversal of what's real and what's imaginary, because it was later taken up by Christianity. And we're all post-Christian in that sense in the West, and given that the West has spread its claws and tentacles everywhere, I can probably still say we're all post-Christian in that sense. So let's, let's remember how astonishing it is, this reversal of real with imaginary, this development of a culture that's against nature, to the point of not even knowing what nature is anymore, to the point where Lacan in 1959 has to say, hey, hey, if we're going to, if we're going to do an ethics, we've got to go into the real. Enough with this unreal, ideal sort of business. We've lost, we've lost the point somewhere. What does Freud teach us? He teaches us about the catastrophes of neurosis, Lacan says in his ethics seminar. Similar to what Nietzsche says in his genealogy of morals. What has the ascetic ideals what, what has the ascetic ideal done? In what in what how many ways has it ruined health and taste? If I try to enumerate them all, I'll never be done. I'm at least going to try and tell you what it means. Alright? So let's do a little bit of genealogy to remember what it means. First, we'll start with the prehistoric transition, right? So by prehistoric, I mean before Plato introduced this ideal of a good and stuck like in, a, you know, in ancient Greece around 390, 380, 370 BC, if you count Socrates a little bit before. But let's go back before that to the time where we were still animals right into prehistory, right into the Paleolithic era, and talk about what happened there. And I'll use a little bit of Bataille here as well, because I think Bataille's um, his 1957 text, Eroticism, I think is a really good sort of place to understand some of what Lacan is responding to as well. Bataille was a, uh, an associate of Lacan's in the you know, post, post-war Paris. Uh, Lacan actually ended up marrying uh, Bataille's um, uh, first wife, ex-wife, and I, if I'm not mistaken, raising uh, his daughter as his own. And what's Bataille say at the start? Look, we were animals, right? He's not denying Darwin or evolutionary biology or anything like that. He's very interested in anthropology, in particular the anthropology of Marcel Mauss. It was just nature, right? Animality. We were just like other animals. Now, how did we transition away from that? According to Bataille, it's by putting taboos on certain aspects of nature, on certain aspects of desire, on those aspects pertaining in particular to sex 
and death on those aspects pertaining to violence, right? And that's kind of what Lacan calls the real, in a, in a sense, those parts, the real, right? So we put taboos on certain aspects of nature. Why? To steady the ship, to create a steady state of consciousness so we can develop tools, so we can develop communities, so we can build better shelters, better homes, uh, so we can raise the kids, so we can commune in ways where people aren't trying to, if you pardon my language, fucking fight each other every, every five seconds. All right? And this is what develops the symbolic order. And by the symbolic order, I mean the order of things. The human world governed by work and respect for taboos. So what happens to these aspects of nature that we put taboos on? Do they just disappear? Do they, are they happy just being, uh, just trickling out and being, are these drives happy being only satisfied just a little bit while everyone's busy working? Is anybody any more satisfied with that today? Isn't that why society and civilization has its discontents, as Freud will say later? Well, back before Plato, this material that was the object of taboo would come back as part of the religious moment, the moment of the sacred. And this moment was marked by transgression of taboos. This is Bataille's, uh, I think, really interesting contribution to, to ethics, is to bring out the erotics of it. Transgression doesn't oppose the taboo. Transgression completes the taboo's moment. What's compressed later returns. Returns in the imaginary. It's the time of the gods, the divinities, spirits. And this is a traditionally a time of license, right? So all the normal taboos that are in place get suspended for that moment and people get their release. It might be, say, a feast day, instead of don't eat too much, accumulate all your reserves. Today, you know, you slaughter the sacred cow and everybody has a feast. It could be intoxication, dancing, sexual license. Uh, the, the sacrifice could be life sacrifice. Um, not just animal, but also human, if you look at the, uh, I think it was the Aztecs. And, um, Bataille and Roger Kawar and Mouse and Mouse with anthropology, they're interested in you know, doing their proper ethnography, looking at different cultures across different times. But this leads us to the third uh, register of Lacan's, what I call Lacan's deflationary ontology, and that's the imaginary. When this stuff returns, And there you have a theory of being, if you like. There's the real, right? Nature. There's the symbolic, which is the human world of work made possible by taboos on certain aspects of nature. And then there's the imaginary, when this material returns as the sacred moment of religious transgression. And that's prehistory, right? This I suggest characterises pretty much all cultures up until uh, Platonism sort of takes root. Oh, but you know, you're going to get little minor variations and trends uh, that differ as we go along. But fast forwarding a little bit to the, uh, to the, um, to the classical age, what Lacan calls the fertile moment of Hellenism, when a lot of the uh, you know, great discoveries um, were, were being made. We have a particular way of celebrating this, this sacred moment of, of release, of transgression, and that's tragedy, Greek tragedy. The festival of Dionysus. It's not merely 
a time of license anymore. That, that part is there, but it's also these amazing plays, right? And what Lacan does in his ethics seminar is give us a close reading of Sophocles' Antigone. Close reading, line by line, passage by passage, going uh, through to the Greek, which I spent a lot of time covering and checking and, and trying to examine in my own, my own thesis. Because in these moments of transgression, we have an ethics which allows that release, but doesn't just give us a release, a satisfaction of the drive, it also gives us a passage to knowledge of the drive. Why? It's because of the articulations involved by the poets, by these great poets. So, for instance, when Sophocles gives us his play Antigone, and Lacan has a look at this play and says, what do we have here? We have Creon versus Antigone, right? Creon identifies himself and his decree with the good. I have the good. I know what's best, the good of all, the common good. I am the sovereign good, pretty much. And Antigone, your brother shall not be buried. He should lay upon the ground, rotting in the open air, until dogs and vultures scatter his limbs everywhere. Antigone, of course, famously says no. She buries him anyway. Her answer to Creon is, look, you know, those laws were made by you, not Zeus. But Lacan sort of goes back to the Greek and says she's also saying, but you know what? Zeus didn't tell me to like, uh, bury my brother either. I'm not really doing it because I'm more you know, pious than you towards the gods, the unwritten law that you must bury your body. And I'm not really sort of more, more pious to the family. It's, you know, I'm only doing it because of my brother. I'm, I'm so bound by that. She's saying, I wouldn't have done the same thing for a husband or a child because I could always have had another child with another husband. Or go with another husband and have another child. But my brother is my brother. He's unique. And Lacan's going to bring out that he's no ordinary brother. Because as the daughter and the son of Oedipus, her brother is also her father. In other words, her father is Oedipus, so she's also his sister. Does that get nicely confusing? Dr. Jaw family tree. So what we have here is a metaphorization of what incest is. And what is incest? It's one of the fundamental taboos that helps us make this passage from animal to human or nature to culture, as Levi Strauss puts it. And by allowing this incest dimension to occur during the play, what's Sophocles and what's, what's the festival doing? It's metaphorizing for us this moment of crossing over, this moment of crossing away from the good towards the real, right? Creon resists, caught up in the good, and he cops it. His son, dead. His wife, dead. His reign, finished. So what Lacan's saying is going on in this, in this play is a kind of an ethics of tragedy, which is also the ethics of psychoanalysis. It's like, don't be like Creon. Don't ignore the real. Don't ignore our right to the real in the right moment, in the right amount. Antigone, her splendour, is there to remind us of the older sense of the sacred, which is soon to become lost because of Platonism. So let's have a look at Platonism. What we have with Platonism is the birth of this idea of the sovereign good, the one good, which of course is very popular amongst people who look back towards the Greeks from a Christian sort of lens. Plato introduces the one, the one divinity, the one good, the one pure good, not like these other Homeric gods who, you know, who fuck and fight and, and you know, are excessive in all their passions. 
But you can really observe what's, what, what shift is going on here from the perspective of Lacan's tripartite ontology. Let me demonstrate. The good is up the top in the imaginary, right? It's a divine entity in Plato's schema. But he doesn't see it as this sort of uh, something there to sanction the return of repressed desire in some kind of sacred erotic transgression. No, for him it's there to turn us away from desire and from the drives and from nature more definitively. So instead we've got a direction going from top to bottom, like this. What he's trying to do is install this good in the imaginary to suppress the real across all times. That's why he wants to ban the poets from his republic. That's why he doesn't like tragedy. That's why Socrates doesn't get tragedy, as, as Lacan says as well. He goes, open up any text of Plato. You know, Nietzsche put his finger on it. Socrates and Plato, they don't get tragedy. They don't, they don't understand it. They're taking flight from the real. They think we can do away with the real at all times. They want the imaginary to just reinforce the symbolic at all times, keep the taboos in there forever. Why? Because Athens and Sparta had this massive civil war. It destroyed the great you know, golden epoch of Hellenism. So they want to give morality and rationality a metaphysical extension. They think, let's just uh, do away with you know, the sensory, with the drives, with instincts, with the animal side. Uh, let's introduce an asceticism, a turning away and we'll be better off. We'll all be pure and moral all the time. And what happens to this repressed material? Of course, as the Freudian experience teaches, it returns, but as repressed. And when it returns, dammed up, perversified, if I can invent a new word, it starts reinforcing this push of the symbolic towards the real, and that's when it gets excessive. And that's when you start getting the catastrophes of, of neurosis, of people cutting too much, always trying to cut away the drives, cut away desire, cut away satisfaction, do away with sexuality, ban it, prohibit it, abolish it, anything else to do with moments of transgression, whether it's alcohol or, or sports or Whatever. <clears throat> Might start to look like the Freudian superego after a while. Right? The more you renounce, the more power you give it, the more it demands. Like when a, uh, you know, a right-wing government comes in and brings in austerity measures. You've got less money, you've got less resources. Does that make you better? No, because you're giving up your money to people who now have more power to introduce more austerity, if I can use a bit of a political analogy. That's what's going on here in the sort of moral dimension. Now, what's Lacan do here? We have to turn out a seminar eight, his seminar on the transference, which I am told by our friends at the uh, New Lacanian School. Uh, he's coming out next year, I think. Yeah, Bruce Fink might be bringing that one out, yeah. Uh, I was using the, uh, the un, uh, unedited uh, versions, which are put out by um, a guy called Gallagher, translator, which you can find online. But once the official version comes out, it'll be, uh, there'll be a bit of a scholarly apparatus, there'll be an official translation, so it's going to make working from it um, just a little bit more pleasant than it was for me. What Lacan says at the start of this uh, seminar, Seminar 8, on transference, is the transference to Socrates is the longest the history of thought has known. Right? The transference to Socrates, i.e. the transference of authority to him and his construction of the sovereign good as the one supposed to know. Right? That's Socrates. Especially as inaugurated by Plato. Which text should we look at? Well, Lacan looks at the symposium. Plato's famous symposium. Well, the topic of discussion at this drinking party is love. Right? And where Socrates is in attendance. And again, just like his treatment of Antigone, we have a close reading, line by line, 
passage by passage, probably even closer, even more detailed. He probably uh, getting into it. He really enjoyed his uh, journey with Antigone, the seminar before. So yeah, it probably, probably takes the first half of the seminar, the whole, whole half of the book that's going to come out. Antigone might have been a, a really nice quarter in the previous seminar. Socrates, when it's his turn to speak, he throws over to this imaginary mystic woman called Diotima, and she talks about this ladder of love. She says, what happens? This is how love works, right? You see the beauty of bodies, individual bodies. Right? Of course, we're talking about natural beauty, so we're down at the lower end of this hierarchy he's about to introduce. Then you notice, well, if it can be more than one beautiful body, why is that? Why is there more than one beautiful person? Why is there not just you know, Brad Pitt, but George Clooney and all these other douchebags we get, we get sick of? Right? There must be this idea of the good, this form of the good. So we start abstracting, right? The form of the good, we're getting higher, up this slope, that is going to drop. What about other beauties, like the beauties of great poetry, or the beauties of great science, or the beauties of um, you know, great literature? Okay, they're even higher up because they're more abstract. The further you get from the body, the higher you up towards, the higher up you are towards the good, until at the very top you've got the good itself or the beautiful itself, which is close to the good because not connected with anything fleshy or bodily or anything connected to mortal trash. I think is the standard translation, right? Up the top. So what he does in a sense is subordinate eros to agape. From Eros, you still have the presence of Eros because it's still ancient Greece, right? It's not the Christian Dark Ages yet. You still have physical beauty everywhere. But it's only there to help you like ascend towards this ladder, up this ladder, towards the good, which is defined as the opposite to anything natural, anything bodily. And once you get there, wait till you die and then you go to heaven. You'll be with it the whole time. That's the Platonic myth, the myth of metempsychosis, as, uh, as Lacan calls it, which is more prominent in some of his other uh, dialogues. For instance, the Phaedo and the Republic come to mind, where he talks about uh, the task of life is to prepare yourself for death by turning away. Turn away from the body, turn away from your sexuality, turn away from your libido, turn away from all your drives and instincts, turn away from anything that can be read as... Uh, as natural, as egotistical, right? what that is all about, of course, but it's the excessive turning away that creates this problem of people living as if they are dead, waiting for death to give them life, which is uh, how Bataille quotes, uh, I think, a Catholic priest in, in his eroticism book, which I think is, uh, has its roots in this sort of tradition here. So that's Platonism. But what happens in a symposium is that Socrates appears, I mean, Alcibiades appears, right? Alcibiades is this you know, handsome Athenian general of wild but large repute. Lacan says you've got to imagine him like some kind of, uh, imagine if James Dean was JFK, they were the one person, that sort of, not only a political uh, you know, powerhouse, but also has this sort of sex appeal or aura that has everyone you know, in a buzz, constantly. And he turns up, and Lacan says, no matter how fascinating all these mirages about the, the good and this ladder of love and the Otima are, Alcibiades bursts in drunk, unannounced, surrounded by girls and flute players and stuff, and that brings us back to how it really is. That gives us back, brings us back to the real. And now Socrates is under pressure. Why? Because... As he says, as Alcibiades says, Socrates was the first to have loved me. Or as Socrates says, Alcibiades, I was the first to have loved him. They were actually partners of some sort in that sort of ancient Athenian custom of the, the lover and the beloved. Where an older male and a younger youth will hook up together in some kind of relationship. Homoerotic relationship, though not exclusive. So it's not as if... Uh, that means they don't have, they get married and have kids as well. But it was part of the custom of friendship in those days was to have a sexual component. And people couldn't understand why Socrates would be attracted 
to Alcibiades and vice versa? How did they sort of team up and become sort of bosom buddies, uh, fighting wars together, etc., etc.? And Alcibiades gives us his story. And Lacan's very fascinated by this story. Because, as is usually his method, when he finds you know, commentators later on getting into sort of hysterics over these passages, oh my God, look, what's this passage doing there? Maybe somebody added it in later, it's obscene. That's when Lacan says, that's the part you focus on, because that's the real. It's the same in that speech Antigone gives, when she said, oh God, I wouldn't have done this for a husband or a child. Could have had another husband and another child with another husband, who cares? Even Goethe say, oh my God, like, why is this beautiful image of Antigone, the virtuous Antigone, suddenly spoilt by this horrible passage? Maybe someone like added it in later. And Lacan's saying, no, 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 maybe that's the real showing itself. It's the ripples it creates amongst commentators that pricks his ears, his Lacanian ears, if you like. And Alcibiades starts telling the story about how he once tried to get Socrates to have sex with him, and how Socrates turned him down. And once Socrates turns him down, suddenly Socrates has all the hand. Because before that he had no hand. Socrates is known as this sort of like you know, interesting sort of figure who, as Alcibiades tells it, he stalks the handsome. He's like attracted to the most handsome, the most beautiful ones, as if he really like loves beauty and like physical beauty. And Alcibiades says, but actually he hates it. He hates it. And look, I tried to get him to have sex with me, I gave him all the opportunities, and he's like, nah. And Alcibiades like, finally I said, look, I oh, know you're like you're this moral philosopher, you know, and I'm like, you know, have all this physical prowess. How about if you teach him what the good is, I'll let you have sex with my body. Right? Which would have been a kind of fair sort of trade in, in ancient Athens. That's sort of how it works. It's like the older males attracted to the youth, the beauty of the youth, and in this process of sexual gratification, the elder is supposed to teach the younger how to become uh, a citizen one day by educating him through this process. Planting in the seed of knowledge, if you like. You know, it might sound embarrassing by today's standards, but as Nietzsche says, don't forget where philosophy started. It was the beauty of Athenian youths. But for Socrates, still not good enough. He's like, he says to Alcibiades, that's like trying to trade in brass for gold. As in, if I had this sovereign good, this moral good that I could teach you as a source of knowledge, it'd be worth way more than anything that you could offer me by way of your body. So you see that sort of privileging of the top of the ladder over against the bottom. He says, Alcibiades, don't worry about the material realm, the natural realm. Look to your soul. And it's not always a bad idea, right? If you've got somebody who's overly fixated on the physical, the material, the natural, of course, you want to tell them, hey, have a think about it. Look to your soul. Question. Don't be a blind addict of, of this realm. But what happens, unfortunately, through this shift in values, is, as Nietzsche puts it, twin decadence running side by side. In Freudian terms, I say what you get there is a dialectic between the neurotic and the pervert, between neurosis and perversion. I think we should be with Freud on this issue and just maintain a little bit of analytic neutrality because both sides can be as blind as each other and both can be just as ignorant of the real as each other. In fact, one side will often cause the other. And it's sort of it's in there in Alcibiades' speech. It's like the repression gets put in, Alcibiades returns as even more perverse. Thucydides', Thucydides remarks of all these wild, uncontrolled transgressions that made him sort of uh, an object of public envy and hysteria. Like Athens probably would have won the war if they didn't keep getting hysterical over Alcibiades and now, one day they're voting general, the next day they vote him out of the city. And he does, he has a lot of trouble controlling himself. Which doesn't make Socrates the good, right, from this perspective, because as Lacan says about Socrates, you know, in short, he's a kind of madman. He believes he's some kind of messiah from this oracle uh, that's told him he's the wisest man in the world because, because he knows that he knows nothing. And he believes, in a sense, that when he dies, as a reward for his practice, he's going to go to this heaven of the good, which is the real world. He believes this imaginary is real. Good luck to him. He's a very interesting figure, right? But what happens afterwards is Plato turns it into an ideology. And that's where we kind of get stuck. And that's when I'll shift across 
to Christianity. I go through these epochs chapter by chapter in the book, so if you're looking for more detail, more scholarship, I'm trying to abbreviate what's going on in there, but there's a whole lot of sourcing going on, just to make sure the, the trajectory is correct. All right, Christianity. The picture you get, in particular from Nietzsche, if you guys are familiar with the genealogy of morals and the Antichrist, is an exacerbation of the heretofore Platonism. Platonism with the Plato and Platonism with its slander of the senses, says Nietzsche, prepares the soil for Christianity. which is not some vague idea, but an actual, you know, a father figure. The father who art in heaven, the God of the good, as Petite calls it. And the repression gets deeper. So that the real... starts to get annulled. The symbolic is there to castrate us of nature in the Christian tradition. How did this happen? Nietzsche says, okay, it wasn't just Plato that prepared us for this, for this uh, wrong move where everything went awry, more awry, he'd say. But we've got to look at the history of Israel itself. And he says, the history of Israel can be characterised by five stages of denaturalisation. They turned further and further away from nature as things went more and more wrong for them. And you get a sort of sense of this in Freud's Moses and Monotheism as well. Until they said, okay, you know, the temple's been destroyed, we've been exiled. Do you know why? It's because once upon a time we had a great kingdom and that was a sin. We should, get, we should be more moral, like more separated from nature and the more denaturalised we are, right? the more Yahweh will one day reward us. And Nietzsche sees you know, Jesus as the final consequence of this, who he infamously uh, likens to a case of a tardive puberty, which sounds like a throwaway line, but if you think about it from the Freudian psychosexual uh, developmental perspective, it's probably not that far off. Resist not, turn the other cheek, nothing somatic, nothing physical. The recoil from everything touchable is all Nietzsche's uh, description of, uh, of Jesus in the, in the Antichrist. Turn away, turn away from everything natural. Feel the bliss now, it's in you, right? This sort of agapic love, unconditional love. Nothing to do with bodies or anything at the bottom of the ladder. Which still had a place, a lingering, a residual place in Platonism, but just it was there but debased. With Christianity, you get a total turning away from it. A total detachment from it, if you like. A withdrawal into the imaginary. That's the Nietzschean picture. Now what's Freud going to say of all this? This is where Lacan accuses Freud of slipping into a bit of strange Christocentrism. Right? Why would it be strange or odd for Freud to slip into a bit of Christocentrism? A, because he's not Christian. B, because he's atheist. And see, because, well, you know, he's still kind of connected to his you know, Jewish sort of culture to a certain degree. <clears throat> Not in a religious way, but he certainly doesn't sort of usually see much positive with Christianity. For instance, the love thy neighbour uh, commandment. He thinks he's just gone too far. He says the historical spectacle of, you know, the people who took up this commandment doesn't measure up very well with uh, the results. You don't end up with a lot of loving of the neighbour, you end up with you know, crusades and inquisitions and neurosis. But okay, but what does Freud find positive of this story? This is when you've got to go into his theory of the primal father of the hordes. So Freud himself takes us back to the prehistoric eras, to the Paleolithic eras, and says, We all once lived in these hordes with a dominant male, a father, right? A primal father 
who would dominate all the women, right? Forbid any of the other males, the sons, from having access to the women, and kick them out as soon as they got of breeding or mating age, if you like, as soon as puberty hit. And after a while, all these, all these like sons that have been kicked out got pretty pissed off with this, so they band together as a band of brothers and murder the father. They gang up on him, right? These primal fathers. But then they miss him, right? They miss their father, the powerful father, and they realise that none of them, they feel that none of them can take his place on their own. So what they do is say, okay, let's put a taboo on incest. Let's make this passage of nature to a different kind of culture by putting in a taboo on incest. This is in the Freudian, uh, Freudian uh, uh, paper Totem and Taboo, and he recapitulates on this in Moses and Monotheism. Why? What on earth has, has Moses and Oedipus got to do with all this? Lacan will constantly say. Because Lacan thinks, I mean, Freud thinks that there were two Moseses, or Moses I, I don't know how to say them through, right? <laughs> one of them was Egyptian. He was the one who learnt about monotheism from the Pharaoh Akhenaten, who tried to get rid of their polytheism and install a kind of monotheistic sort of god of the good figure in ancient Egypt. But he fails. The pandemonium of the gods, the, you know, the polytheistic gods, returns. So this Egyptian Moses leads the Jews out into the desert. Where the Jews kill him. Why? Because they develop resentment for all these like strict taboos that are put on them. You know, give me back my beer, give me back my TV, don't take away my, my drive, my response, my enjoyment, right? Resentment towards the leader leads them to kill him. Then they cover it up. Again, they, they feel bad about it. Right? And at some point, a second Moses emerges for Freud. Completely different figure. This is the one from Sinai who gets the Ten Commandments. An obscure, irrationalist sort of figure. Right? Rally, uh, rallying on about commandments and fire and brimstone. Uh, talking about Yahweh, this volcano god. And over time, on the Semitic Peninsula, the first Moses becomes... Well, the second Moses becomes more and more like the first Moses in people's memory. Just like this Yahweh volcano god becomes more and more like Akhenaten's original god in their imaginaries. And to get Judaism as we know it today. And then with Jesus, you have this new kind of outbreak amongst the Israeli people, the Judaic people. But this time, they kill him without covering it up. So Freud says, you know what? Christianity is in a sense a progressive fulfilment of this whole uh, Hebraic history. Why? Because now the murder of the primal father is up there for all to see. There's not one here, fortunately. On the cross. Right? We know we murdered the father, the leader. We're not hiding it anymore. Now we can stop. Now we can uh, you know, be sufficiently castrated of all these excessive, unruly, anarchic, uh, the bitter and aggressive drives and sacrifice it like Jesus did. Right? He did it for us. Now, Lacan calls this Freud's cock and bull story. Right? And it's pretty you know, surprising to hear Lacan talk about Freud that way. He has you know, the utmost respect for him. He calls the Oedipus complex Freud's dream, right? which is a yeah. massive shift. So we've gone into Seminar 17 here, which came out uh, four years ago. And it was um, translated by Russell Brigg, who supervised my, um, my work at the dissertation stage. Suddenly, Lacan's calling Oedipus Complex Freud's dream. And it's calling this primal father story a hysterics fantasy. Why? Because we today miss the father being able to provide this regulatory structuring of our drives. Instead, we can't control them, we suffer, we don't know how to handle our jouissance, we wish, we wish there was this primal father or some kind of god or some kind of Oedipus complex, right, that happened at the early days of development to just structure our drives in the normal heterosexual monogamous development. So Lacan thinks Freud was misled by the hysterics in his clinic and was maybe being a little bit hysteric himself in mistaking his, this fantasy for historical fact, actual historical fact. 
But I think there's something else going on here that we can bring in from the Nietzschean perspective. And that's that the people who were really murdered for this, uh, you know, this kind of structure to take hold, this Christian, Christocentric Oedipus structure, was you know, the great noble figures of, of Hellenes Moss, the Greco-Roman tradition, the philosophers, the scientists, the poets. They were the ones that were murdered. And Nietzsche says, look, now all the traditions of science, you know, like mechanics, mathematics, working in combination with the senses, they were there with their traditions and their schools centuries old, all of this committed to the flames overnight and replaced by what? Christianity, with its schools and traditions centuries long of holy line, pious line or pious fraud, fraudulence. So Nietzsche describes um, the whole Hebraic uh, tradition when the imaginary is called real and the real is called imaginary, right? In the Platonic world, the sensory world is just an imperfect copy of the supersensory world, away from the body, away from the earth, away from nature. It shifts the center of gravity away from right here and now. Which can, of course, be seen as a problem when you, talk, when you think about the environmental destruction that's going on. This disrespect for nature, this disrespect for earth, this disrespect for animality, ignorance of our own, projected outwards. Yeah, and this sort of like the Renaissance, okay, we're bringing it back. Destroy, again, by Luther, Nietzsche says. Okay, the Enlightenment, okay, we're getting it back now, separation church from state. Destroyed, again, Nietzsche says, by these Puritan secularizations of Christian values. We are, to use the Freudian term, repeating instead of remembering. We're repeating the murder of these primal figures, originary figures, to use a more Heideggerian term, right? Because, as some of Nietzsche's scholarship points out, like the uh, Ubermensch for Nietzsche is not some you know, great orangutan back in the prehistoric ages, as Freud thought. It's the Greek and Roman nobles. You know, the source of the amazing primary texts we have, intellectual texts. So now we enter into the modern world, the world of modern science and capitalism. Epoch 4, the last one. To outline this in terms of Lacan's tripartite ontology, What we have in the modern world is basically no more imaginary. We've overthrown our religious sort of cathexis, if you like. We don't believe in superstitions and fairies and angels and gods and talking about educated, you know, scientific types, people who are in the know, reading you know, Nietzsche and Freud and studying evolution and biology, etc. Right. Generally, we don't believe in the imaginary. It's up to you. It's a private thing. If you want to be religious, you do it privately. It's not part of the state anymore connected to politics. But do we recover the real? No. All we are left with is the symbolic. This is what Lacan calls the service of goods. We've gone from the idea of the good, Plato, God of the good, Christianity, the service of goods, today where science is subordinated to the realm of production of goods and services. The service of goods. At some point, we were convinced by the master, or the master was convinced, to fund the sciences. And Lacan parodies this moment in Seminar 7, and he goes back to it again in Seminar 17. The science, science said to the master, now give us a little money, we'll put all these goods, all these contraptions and gadgets at your disposal. Think how much extra power you know, you'll get from that. So you've got you know, our world today, consumerism, entertainment. But we still have trouble understanding the real. Like we don't really get it in a, in a tuned way. And these, comes up, these come up in a lot of uh, the math things that Khan developed to describe this epoch. For example, uh, That's what he calls the 
uh, the discourse of university, this discourse of science. And the bottom right, what gets produced is the split subject. Keep on knowing, keep on producing knowledge, right? Know more and more and more and more. What you never get to do is think about your own desire. And this is in nature as well, and it's a critique of the way science is invested in the genealogy of morals, SA3. Head smoking day or night, produce more knowledge, produce more goods through applied knowledge, consume more, accumulate more, more riches. Whatever you do, don't stop and think about yourself, about your desire, about whether there is meaning or why there is absolutely none. While we're part of this system that continues to alienate us and doesn't just destroy our people, but potentially destroys a planet. Why can't we do nothing to stop it? We keep consuming these objects, say, as Lacan calls them, which are there to sort of act as some kind of stopper to fill in the lack. I feel alienated, I'll have this cream pie. I feel alienated, I'll go watch a Sylvester Stallone film. Is that going to make good the loss? No, of course not. But there's people there to tell us that, that it will. Just keep consuming. Keep producing more knowledge that can produce more, gadget, more gadgets to produce more crap that only reinforces the alienation. What you never get is that controlled, organised, non-productive expenditure, non-utilitarian expenditure that you'd get in the potluck societies, of which tragedy is an example. Expenditure without the hope of a return in profit. You know, Pericles would fund Aeschylus putting on a play. Right? If he did that today, he'd put up a fence around and charge admission too. So it's, not, it's all about accumulating more profit. Nobody wants to spend just so we can get more knowledge and release for the drive without the hope of accumulating more and more and more. It's all about accumulation. This is very big in uh, Bataille's uh, uh, analysis of general economy. However, Nietzsche and Lacan also have a lot of positive things to say about science, science and scholarship. So what they're, talking, what they're complaining about is the way... You know, science is made to serve the ascetic ideal, the sovereign good again. The problem is they have different positive things to say about science. For Nietzsche, the strength of science is its empiricism. For Lacan, the strength of science is its mathematical formalism. So, do we have a split between them and antinomy? Well, I thought about this for a long time and I found a book by Alexander Coire on the, uh, I think it was called Newton's Great Synthesis or The Significance of Newton. And Coire, of course, is Lacan's main influence in, in the philosophy of science. And Coire says, the strength of science is to synthesize both trends, the empirical with the mathematical. And I'm like, aha, well, let's just do that with Nietzsche and Lacan as well, with their philosophy of science, to create a balance, a proper balance between the empirical and the mathematical. Because if we think no knowledge can come from the senses, we get back to Platonism. This is just an imperfect delusionary copy that's going to take you away from the good. And why do we need some positive relation to science? Because it gives us knowledge, it does. It really does give us knowledge. We've just got to recognise what its limits are. I think this is the, what's common to the ethics of Lacan and Nietzsche. We've got to recognise what the limits of science are through what science teaches us and then at the periphery preserve a space for the return of desire. Not as repressed desire, but just as something that's been put aside for a while in order to be brought back in a sacred moment according to an ethics of transgression, in, according to a kind of erotics, in the right moment. So we can affirm right, the human condition, the seeming tragedy about it, in a way that leaves us better equipped to handle the real in future. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Before we throw the meeting open to questions and discussion with Tim Themi, I have a number of announcements. The first of which is that, as I mentioned before, the Existential Society doesn't have a formal membership. Therefore, we don't have a membership fee. So although our meetings are free, we'd nevertheless be grateful if you could spare a dollar or two towards a donation to the Unitarian Church for allowing us atheists to have our meetings here. Um, well, you're not all atheists, of course. Some of us aren't. Um, so if the begging bowls could be passed around and you can afford it, afford a couple of dollars, uh, 
But if you don't wish to contribute, well, thank you for coming anyway. <laughs> we meet here on the first Tuesday of the month, so our next lecture will take place on Tuesday the 7th of October. And Dr. Mahmoud Adani from the Historical and Philosophical Studies Department at the University of Melbourne will be speaking on what has happened to the authentic being in philosophy. Ahmad Adani addressed us previously, quite a uh, number of years ago, uh, a couple of times, in August 2005, he spoke on Albert Camus and Algeria. What did they learn from each other? And prior to that, in June 2003, he spoke on what did Nietzsche learn from Zarathustra? So he'll be speaking here on the 7th of October. If you didn't get a program, they're available on the table in the foyer. If um, our URL is, uh, for our websites on the program, if you uh, click onto the previous lectures section, uh, you'll find that some of the lecturers have uh, given their transcripts or their lecture notes or a website that you can look at to uh, find some of their material. And I presume that Tim will do the same or whatever. Yeah, I can give you my notes. And I'm also recording this, hopefully, with my uh, oh, right. new okay. object date. Yeah, sure, iPhone. great, yeah. great. Yes. <coughs> Pardon me. Yes, so if you click on the previous lectures section, you'll find that uh, there are uh, transcripts and lecture notes and often uh, our lecturers have a website which they put their, some of their material up on or have links on it to others. Um, look, I'd like to apologise for those of you who happen to come uh, expecting the, uh, the original scheduled speaker who... Um, um, <coughs> Vaughan Rapatahana, who uh, unfortunately got posted to New Zealand, and so uh, Tim stepped in, uh, thankfully, um, to, to, for tonight's lecture. Now, also, uh, if you're interested, uh, the Freudian School of Melbourne, uh, which is associated with the School of Lacanian Psychoanalysis, uh, having a uh, conference this weekend, at least this Saturday, on um, the family complexes and complexities. Uh, if you Google them, uh, you'll be able to uh, get onto their website. Uh, their website is www.fsom.org.au. The FSOM is Freudian School of Melbourne. It's a, it's a full day conference. <coughs> Pardon me. On the table in the foyer, you'll find there's um, a number of leaflets uh, promoting other philosophical activities, etc. Uh, courses, seminars, lectures, um, uh, philosophy cafes, uh, etc. You'll notice on the table, if you look, I'll draw your attention to a couple. The, uh, Philosophy Forum, but I'm, uh, the reason I'm mentioning them is they'll be right here on Sunday at 12.30 and Lev Lafayette will be uh, speaking on the metaphysics of physicalism and idealism. And immediately following that here at, uh, at 2.30, that was Philosophy Forum was at 12.30, at 2.30 the Agnostics Group uh, <coughs> And their subject is uh, Mastering Mortality, Life and Death from a Hitchensian Perspective. The speaker is Jonathan Meadows from the uh, Ration Society, and their leaflets on the table as well. And finally, uh, I'll draw your attention to the, uh, the Sea of Faith Network. I'm addressing them on Zarathustra and that will take place on Thursday, the 18th of September at the Carlton Library. Uh, 
Tea and coffee and Vicky's are available in the kitchen uh, following our, the end of our discussion. <laughs> uh, the uh, toilets are around there if you haven't found them already. And um, um, that's about all other than to tell you that last month we were able to give the Unitarian Church a donation of $50 for the use of their premises. And so thank you for tonight's donation. And I'll hand you back to Tim. Thank you. That microphone comes apart if you want. Oh, OK. Ah, yes. For, for Nietzsche, the great sort of uh, scoundrel aspect of what Plato did was to conflate those three things. It's to say the good is the beautiful and it's also the truth. The truth is the good and it's also the beautiful. Why wouldn't the truth be ugly, for instance, is what Nietzsche asks. And Lacan says the same thing, like what? The truth is, is good, the truth is beautiful. You'd have to have the devil in you to imagine such a thing, right? So it's a bit of a sort of, I guess, a... Um, Sleight of hand, I think that Plato is trying that. Nietzsche would say, and I think maybe Lacan would say the same thing too from the psychoanalytic perspective. Yep. You say, uh, generally speaking, in a recycling of history, if you put it that way in various ways, you give it an impulse. Are you saying that um, humanity is actually just recycling a natural? Or are you saying humanity has evolved that pattern? I think, or, yeah, I think the latter. I think you know, Nietzsche might even call it the eternal return of the same. Yeah. yeah, we keep sort of going through these sort of similar patterns where we try to repress, repress returns, and then we're all perverse for a while, and then we realise that that's going to be really destructive, so we bring in the repression again. What we never bring in is knowledge of the truth behind that cycle, which is why we're blindly repeating the same. We are repeating instead of remembering or acknowledging or understanding. I was going to say, this pattern pre-exists man in nature. Uh, they must define the way this has been defined, but they're really biological patterns that pre-existed prior to man. That would probably be a metaphysical speculation, which uh, I wouldn't want to enter into. I'm I'm sure you could. <laughs> um, questions or comments? There and then there. Yep. Not quite. Nearly. It's. I think it's more to do with. Uh, say, unconscious desire, or desire that is repressed to the unconscious because it goes beyond our normal uh, modes of expression. So beyond the pleasure principle, Freud might say when he's talking about the death drive, and what he means by that is the drive or desire that goes beyond the correlation that the pleasure principle usually forms with the reality principle. A reality principle is there to limit our, our pleasure, Right? So, okay, I can have one cake but not ten. Right? I can have one beer but not a slab. At least not every day or for every meal. Right? And, uh, but what happens to those drives to go beyond those norms? They typically get repressed. And we're not just talking about simplistic things like food and alcohol, but sexual desires. You think about, say, the homophobic uh, person who has repressed homosexual drives. Or you think about a very chaste person who really would like to you know, be a sex worker and therefore have as much sex as they can. So we're talking about dry, drives or desires that are unpalatable to deal with. Instead. But maybe we have to bring in the distinction between the pre- and post-symbolic real. Because um, so Freud sort of mentions that when drives are repressed, they tend to dam up and take on more extreme forms. 
so they can look sort of more severe than they actually are. So we may have these extremely perverse desires, only because we've repressed desires that were a little bit perverse, <coughs> only relative to a norm that maybe was too sort of narrow, if that makes sense. I think it's all about uh, going back to this pre notion of taboo and transgression. But like we put taboos on, on, on drives, but not to the point where we try to deny them, demonise them and falsify them. We're just setting them aside for a while. So we don't let them dam up and come back as Lucifer or anything like that. We're just setting them aside for a while as not right now, not, you know, not the right time and place. And when they come, come out, we do it in a way that allows us to, to have knowledge about them as we get some satisfaction of these drives as well. Which I think, uh, you know, Greek tragedy as part of the Dionysian festival is probably uh, a model for. So if you're interested in, uh, uh, if, if you get into Bataille, his theory of, knowledge, uh, his theory of religion and his uh, eroticism text, you'll see, I think, uh, uh, a good example of how we can regulate the drives without fall, falling prey to aggressive moralising, um, which is, you know, ends up being dishonest and disingenuous and excessive, excessively repressive. Then, then causing excessive perversions. So it's kind of like a type of self-cultivation, More and like... Kind of... More like an ethics of transgression, I'd call it. Yeah. Mm. Could I just add something to yep. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, actually, I was thinking uh, I, I would have been good to mention that, you know, in the discussion. So for Lacan, the psychoanalytic clinic is one of these artifices where we can stage transgressive desire, not necessarily you know, act it out right there and then. In fact, you don't act it out there and then at all. What you do is become conscious of it. What one does become conscious of it yeah. and, and signify it, articulate it in a better way. What about a... Yeah, yeah. Well, look, yeah, because there's also great works of art and literature and what well, James Joyce, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Which debate in particular? Well, I mean, if we just think about what's happening locally with the other government yeah, yeah, and yeah. The, the, the culture around yeah. um, knowledge and mm. social knowledge and science. Yeah. If there's something that might be going on in the niche in the sense of the return of repressed again or something, you know, at the height of the 19th century when science was all at work mm. and, you know, climate modernity and now in this post, post-modern, post-humanist period, Mm, like a return of the irrational, yeah. to use the E.R. Dodd's uh, expression. Yeah. yeah, I guess if there's certain things yeah, they don't want us to know, the powers that be, for instance, the severity of, uh, of destructive climate change. So science gets constrained uh, into the prevailing ideology in a sort of new way. Uh, science didn't give us this uh, you know, utopia of, of universal reason. We some may have been hoping for in the 19th century, or just come to people like that. Um, but I guess it's always because it's being invested or subordinated to the service of goods or to the ascetic ideal in some way. Yeah. So um, science is good as long as you are... I was talking actually to one scientist who said, um, 
If you want to get funding for your project, uh, and then you can show that it can lead to corporate profit, you'll get you know, snapped up like this. They'll snap it up before you even like finish signing it. So, scientists, sort of, it's a double-edged sword. Like, it just depends with what. You know, it just depends how it's being invested. But I think it's very important for us not to become anti-scientific or to become resentful against science. Just see it for for what it is. It doesn't sort of uh, supplant psychoanalysis. Um, uh, the positive science, especially if they are subordinated to you know, the service of goods and the, and the powers that be. I had one over there as well. I want to know how you would define the object of the science. You said before that you think um, science produces goods which Well, sometimes uh, Lacan talked about it as, you know, the Freudian thing is the mother, the mother's body. So, no, you will never... Sorry? Yeah, there'll never be a... Yeah, I think with uh, with more knowledge of the actual process, would be less easy to sort of uh, be led astray, you know, to dangle this carrot and that carrot. We'll know, ah, that's just a cheap substitute for the phallus, or cheap substitute for the mother's breast, or you know, for the strong father, or. So you feel like just understanding it, pretty much just your own. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, it just makes us a little bit more savvy as to how we may be being manipulated by people dangling these various carrots. Um, yeah. uh, there was one here too. And you, yeah. Can I just say, the, 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 the positives of science, though, yeah. is it probably is even circular rather than linear? Because uh, uh, we've got the advances in photography, David Attenborough's style for living science, we've got the photography of the Hubble telescope going out to the physical sciences, and the further we go into it, the more actual awesome and divine it becomes, as far as we're concerned. Yeah. Uh, you're not actually reducing it to materialistic objects at all, yeah. you're actually exploring almost the divinity of it, magnifying the awesomeness of it. Well, it's not strictly part of evolutionary biology to uh, you know, postulate what they might call spooky stuff or divine material, but of, of course we can appreciate I've actually been watching some David Attenborough stuff uh, recently, and yeah, it's amazing, yeah. Increasing probably the non-scientific aspect of science. Yeah, well, look, it, it, is, it is pretty amazing, but as soon as a scientist starts uh, promoting intelligent design, you know, back to you know, some kind of Aristotelian sovereign good at the centre controlling everything, they usually uh, you know, get shown the door, or that's the paper that doesn't get published, and they get told to just keep it private. You know, it's, it's more, those sorts of projections are more to do with their desire than it is with their, with their findings of the empirical world. And that's where things like tragedy are... Becoming available to the ordinary man. Yeah. Life, our soul, so the ordinary man can now experience mm. the esoteric that was the only to them before. Yeah. And they can actually see that there's a different world out there. And that's where things like
actually it's actually the paradox of indescribably sensible these of um, of um, consent, like the actual real pleasure is in non-consent, but then obviously you go into the illegal, so there's that fine line yeah. between so it's so just just practical sense of transgression. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, sir. I've got you I've done some reading of people like Foucault and, and, yeah. and Deleuze, yeah. Um, insofar as we over-classify you know, desires, recover them unconsciously, and, say, okay, this, and, and develop, even developing identities around them, it's almost like the Dionysian is being sort of re-subordinated to some kind of Apollonian structure, and you know, after a while it turns into another sovereign good, which gives people no uh, real satisfaction at all, because it becomes the demand to keep on enjoying, which... I think a lot of uh, contemporary Lacanians, like those Zipunkic and Zizek, yeah. sort of complain about as being one of the traps of capitalism and the and the and the service of goods. But but yeah, but how much actual knowledge of the truth behind that desire goes on? Yeah. You probably need to have something psychoanalytic <coughs> going on. Yeah. And then it becomes an injunction to enjoy, which isn't a pleasurable either. Yeah, exactly. We need a bit of a morus interruptus in order to build a desire and know that there is like a, we have a sort of, some kind of structure that suits us or suits us communally as well. Like, there should be communal sort of uh, celebrations as well. Like there is, like you say, everybody might celebrate uh, grand final day, have a barbecue, and if your team's not playing, if your team's playing, you wear the colours, all the animism is there, you, you shout and scream, and Melbourne Cup Day. But, but that's really, the, the problem with the modern world is it's only at the really superficial level we get any kind of communal celebration. No one's going to celebrate, uh, you know, sort of polis wide, the great new poetic or tragic production, yeah. unless it's Beyonce or something like that. It's always dumbed down to the most superficial level, and you can sort of you know, criticise some of the um, people who are just chasing pleasure and, and satisfaction and stuff. So, well, do they actually know what some of that means? Like, do they know why they like to whip or to be whipped or to have this or to have that? And and I think that should, that passage to knowing should be part of the sort of of that sort of sacred moment of trans transgression. Yeah, there's probably a lot of panelists who are very psychoanalytic, which is bloody too expensive. And yeah, it's not well, practical for it can be. all that. Like, you know, bringing it back to the materialist perception, many people would probably be interested in the psychoanalysis, not really being psychoanalysis, they just can't afford it. Yeah, well, I guess so. Uh, <laughs> it's positive that that's the only way to actually attain understanding of your desire, and it's Yeah, I, I think the other way is, is through you know, meditating on the text. Like to to read Lacan seminar, to read the Freudian papers he's referring to, and then well, you know, you can authorize yourself as an analyst if you, if you do a really good job. And but it's also to sort of read them genealogically as well, and like be aware of the sort of history of the shifts in the real, the symbolic, and the imaginary. And you know, it's it's expensive to get to have an analyst, but it's also expensive to be an analyst. Like you can imagine, it's not like something that gets advertised in the middle of the Channel 9 News and yeah, everyone's flocking to you, you know, like, so... And everyone's perfected, right, so if they get done in years... Yeah, like, there's probably like, only one job that would, would be less financially secure than my own being a philosopher, and that would be being an analyst. That's a, so, you know, you might as well take up both, you know, so... Um, but, yeah, like... Hmm. Well, the experience of meditating on Lacan's text and, and you know, Freud's text and Nietzsche's text and then... Uh, yeah, the, all the periods they're referring to looking at the primary text is, I think, uh, yeah, it is it's quite analytic and I guess there's, there's a way where you can, I think if an analyst is a GP as well, or a psychiatrist first, you can also maybe find a way to chalk it up to Medicare, if, you know, if there's a, well, one can, if there's a sort of financial issue, so you know, if there's the desire, maybe there's the weight, it doesn't have to last five years, ten years, but you know, there might just be for a for a period, as long as as long as the desire is there, where there's a will, there's maybe a bit of a way. Yeah. Uh, should we go there first and then come back to it? Okay. Um, yep. Uh, I was just wondering that there's a lot of mention of signs, and must, well, I recall science always begins as an assertion of that world, but science has a polar opposite, and this is where. A lot of things come in. Mysticism is the polar opposite of science. Science is the assertion upon the world, mm -hmm. and mysticism goes the opposite path. It's receptive to the world. It's just interesting, there's all the mention of science here, but not of the polar opposite, mysticism. Mm. Now, I, I don't know, but it seems to me science seems to follow that at the holy sort of trend, whereas mysticism seems to be much 
more in line with the LIAC. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. And then they back cards because neither science or mysticism on their own, that world conceptions or global views, they are simply paths. Mm. I think uh, when I when I talk about the imaginary uh, or that sacred moment of uh, of transgression or the return of you know, repressed material or material that was made into an object of taboo, I'm talking about a kind of mysticism. The only thing, uh, you know, like something Dionysian, a recapitulation of the real. The only thing I would say about the imaginary is that, sure, we shouldn't fall prey to the, the modern trap of just thinking it's all symbolic. There's no imaginary, there's no real anymore. Um, we should see the imaginary as the imaginary. Like, I think it's a great failure of the imagination to think that, uh, that we can't do without uh, seeing the imaginary as real. I think that's the ultimate failure of imagination. The imaginary is fantastic. I love the imaginary. Yeah, but, but, but who says we have to see it as real? Why can't we see it as a post-symbolic return of a repressed real, but not real itself? society is simply a figment of its own imagination. Mm -hmm. So we are tossing yeah. Oh, we're not. We're not tossing it out. No, it we're just respecting it. Right. He's not real. He's not real. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Does anyone have any solipsism jokes? <laughs> no, no. But I think it's it's very important to see the imaginary as the imaginary, to see it as a return of the repressed real. Like you could sort of see, say, some kind of divine figure. You could have a dream, uh, and it could be very powerful. So, oh my God, it was like I was visited by a god. Who says we have to believe it actually is a God? That's the confused imaginary with the real. Instead, do something a little bit psychoanalytic and interpret, okay, what kind of imaginary was it? How did this relate to my desire or to, the, or to my position within the human condition? So the imaginary is still respected, but I think even more by being seen as the imaginary. As soon as we have to see it as real and start defending ourselves against science and rationality, I think it's, it's a real failure of imagination. Imaginary is fine as the imaginary. Oh my god, who was that? Was that, a, was that a piano? What was that? Some kind of divine intervention. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any more questions? That was the real. Yeah. <laughs> this ghost playing piano. Okay. Yep. I, I just wanted to comment that uh, for many religious strains uh, that are uh, religious kind of uh, religious strains uh, that are holding that people have the many moments yeah. imaginary. Yeah, for them it's very real, yeah. And it's a real problem because there's no way we can, we can reason with them if, if something's going wrong with those, with those projections. How can when you reason somebody who's cert with certain, we're dealing possibly with a psychotic structure? Um, and it's, you know, it's... You know, Freud thought, I can't treat anybody with a psychotic structure because they, they won't believe anything I, I say. They're going to believe I'm part of some conspiracy to deny their God or, or something. But... Um, yeah, it's a good example of how the imaginary reifies and gets seen as real, as real itself. And what it does is actually re repress the real and often lead to uh, a, lot of, a lot of disturbances. Yep. Oh, no, I, I think you did. I, look, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a scholar of, uh, of the Hebraic tradition. I'm not, I don't think I've read that, that biography you're talking about, but from my understanding, he might have met with them, he might have enjoyed them up to a certain point, but he wasn't necessarily a believer himself. I think cause, cause, it was a religious No, no. If, if, if you like, look, look at his um, uh, Future of an Illusion paper, it's his, sort of, his debate with the Protestant pastor Oscar Pfister, and he, he's, he's, he's up there with Dawkins, but better, of course, but... You know, he's, he's saying, no, I'm not going to be swayed into any speculation. Reason and science give us knowledge. And you know, beyond that, the most uh, plausible explanations we're projecting 
something from our own unconscious, our own unconscious repressed <coughs> material is being mistaken as if it's come from without. So if we see a demon in the, in the corner of the room, so there's one, uh, I can't remember which, what his name was, but he, the demonological neurosis paper, 19th century demonological neurosis, he's saying, look, we don't believe there are demons and devils anymore. We say that something from the unconscious repressed material has been you know, projected in some kind of derivative form and taken as if it comes from without. And for Freud, in this case, he said, well, this demon is some kind of projection of that subject's relation to his father during his development. But what's interesting about Lacan in seminar 17 is he said even, not in a necessarily a religious way, but in a way almost Freud got sort of sucked in in a way by all these sort of hysterical projections of his powerful father and started speculating about this primal father in history, which is not a religious myth. He thought it was an actual anthropological reality. It's more like a... Lacan would say a, a, a scientific conjecture that doesn't really turn out to be correct, according to evidence. Yeah. But it's not, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a superpower, he just you know, must have seemed like that because of all the control <coughs> he had, would be the Freudian position. Um, any other questions, or is anyone everyone keen for tea and coffee and biscuits? Yeah, one down the front. Yeah, I guess the, the Nietzschean perspective on, on Buddhism, Buddhism is a, a sort of Eastern version of this sort of ascetic ideal, this idea of turning away from the body and drives and desire, turning away from the ego, and, you know, but not necessarily preparing yourself for some kind of Christian platonic afterlife, but you know, they have their own sort of uh, kind of versions of that. I haven't looked at it too much, no, but, um, but uh, I can see how it might be interesting. Yeah. Would you like to say something from that no, perspective? No, no, no. no? no yeah. Yeah. He likes to go he's into the Eastern stuff. Of she's stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. 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 It's not my field of expertise, but if, if I can in, invoke Sartre to a <coughs> certain extent, given that it's an existential society, I would say that one of, the, one of the modes of bad faith is to reduce ourselves to facticity, to say, this is our biology, therefore we have to be this sort of subject, and there's just a direct deterministic relation. The other version of bad faith commonly overlooked is to deny our facticity. And I just wonder whether some of the Eastern traditions, insofar as they become caught up in a kind of asceticism and seeing all things as illusionary and whether they are sort of guilty of that sort of second version of bad faith. But this would be a question for those who are, who are, who are interested more in the East and are sort of doing more reading in that direction to see how um, you know, the sort of discourses of Nietzsche and Freud and Lacan might extend in that direction or shed light on that direction and, and vice versa. Sure, that would be a, an interesting... Um, are there was a comment there as well? Did you want to go? You're waiting for it. Yeah. Well, I heard somebody say that Buddhist practice was something I 
getting away from the body. I'd like to correct that in this decision. Yeah. And be released to include the Buddhist meditation. Yeah. They can't fight in the body. Yeah. Compared to uh, a, uh, a good, perhaps not an academic, but a uh, <coughs> person who just studies. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard comments like that before. I, yeah, as, as I have to, I have to sort of you know, draw a limit to my you know, my level of knowledge of those traditions. But I just wonder how if it's an imaginary body that that, that is being adhered to there to a certain extent. Sorry. Psychophysical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you know Aristotle thought he was starting with nature as well. Yeah. You, you know, but but, yeah. but Lacan sort of says, well, look, that notion of nature is different to ours, right? Why? Because Aristotle believes there's a sovereign good stuck in the middle of nature. You know, sending out its beams of divine sort of guidance through nature and through our bodies. So, so it's it's nature but imaginarized. Now, there may be traditions within the East, I'm sure, who were much more realist and on top of things than that. And there probably were traditions that weren't. I'm only relying. Yeah. Taoism. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to bring someone in who's an expert on the Eastern traditions uh, in coming upcoming months to uh, to extend these conversations further. Yeah. Do you have a comment you wanted to make too? On thinking about how the sort of bad faith, bad conscience of reality in Christianity often reasserts itself using sort of radical Marxism as well. Um, I often use Nietzsche to deconstruct my friend's sort of very dire, ascetic Marxist mm. views of I am negating earthly pleasures because I'm waiting for this revolution, like a messianic revolution mm. before it will happen. However, then when you start to think about the Yeah, I think when, when you talk about the Puritan forms of uh, left-wing praxis, Marxism, Communism, Socialism, this is what, uh, you know, for Nietzsche, are the sort of secularised versions of Christocentric morality that, you know, that's like, uh, you know, the God is dead but the throne is still warm, then a new idea is put up there, whether it's equality or, or denying the earthly pleasures or, or whatever. Um, I think it's uh, Zizek and Baju between them talk about three positions one can take in terms of left-wing pra praxis. One that is suspicious of pleasures and therefore is a more Puritan form. One that sees pleasures as liberating, so it's a more you know, liberal hedonistic form. And the other, which you know, Zizek says is the third position occupied by Baju, and I think is a sensible position, is to see the real as uh, you know, before good and evil. It's how we respond to the real that should be judged, but the real itself should not be seen as a priori good or a priori evil. It's how we respond to the real and drive and desire um, that determine whether our actions are, can be judged you know, as part of a strong ethics, a good ethics, or a, a weak ethics, or bad ethics. Socialization requires some form of concept of what is the common good to extend. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, we sort of need a, a, a common good yeah. that is open to the real, yeah. that goes further into the real, and so has a sort of deeper roots, if you like. Yeah. So maybe like a good starting point for developing ethics would be to not consider any concept to be ideal or 
Absolutely. Yeah. Like there's no complicated. Period. Okay. Yeah, it does. If there is a common good, it's not something we can put in a simple formula. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was wondering, you know, the initiator uh, explained the success rate of the platonic Christian movement. Though. I mean, it did. we've had two and a half thousand years of a very high success rate there. Mm. So obviously, the platonic Christian view is the winner. Yeah. It's shown that it is the stronger one, and Nietzsche is just yeah. simply a weak reactionary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is this your reductio ad absurdum, or are you just uh, being a devil's advocate, or do you actually hold that belief? Uh, well, I, I think it's a, a relevant view, actually, that yeah. the Christian Platonic civilization was successful. Yeah, there were no Until answers. we arrived at this moment, when you know Nietzsche showed up shortly after Nietzsche, what do we get? Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin. Yeah, well, I think we've been too influenced by the whole wearing with those sorts of uh, conjectures. Um, yeah, look, Nietzsche's explanation of why this denaturalizing uh, asceticism survived, like took off and won, is because it sort of excites fear and wonder. People are denying their drives, they're hallucinating, they're telling these like marvelous stories. And people who have been through trauma, the trauma of a civil war, for instance, in ancient Greece, or the trauma of uh, um, exile and, and, and war, just think, well, maybe we can just do away with nature forever. So for Nietzsche, it's because the real can be traumatic. Nature, as Bataille says, can be violent. So we wish, as a wish fulfillment, that we can do away with it. And you know, it's, it's very easy to let that fantasy win out. But I think if we look over collectively the history of civilization, when we think about the Dark Ages and the book burning and the burning at the stake, and we can say, well, you know, that ideology won, but we didn't. That, that would be the Nietzschean position anyway. Should we uh, leave it? Should we leave it? I was going to say leave it there, or do you want to, one more there? No, just on what you were saying, how much do you think the uh, Platonic idealism facilitated the Christian movement? Because it's not just Christian power. Oh, totally, yeah. He who controls the good controls the world. If, if you can say you're the good, then whoever resists you is evil. And this, this is the, the folly of Creon. He identifies himself with the good, and Lacan says, what, what does the good tell us? He tells us that it's there as an alibi when people want to disavow their own desire. I wasn't there, Your Honor. I was with the good. You know, the good as alibi. All right. I'm going to leave it there. But, um, thank you. I, uh, I have a a case of books that I brought with me um, that I was able to buy at the author discounted price from SUNY, which is 50 bucks. So if you wanted to buy it from Amazon or straight from the press or at a bookstore, probably cost you 80. So I lugged the box out with me tonight in case you wanted it at the discounted price. Uh, so I'm not making any profit on it, neither is the press. It's a state university press, it's not for profit. So if you're interested in uh, picking up the book and going through Passage by passage, page by page, looking at all the sources and the scholarship. Uh, please come and see me and we'll, uh, we'll work something out. All right, thank you. <laughs> no. No tick. <laughs> I just want to have a look at it. Oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to buy it, but I'd want to see it's cold oh, cool. and all that stuff. And